yes okay take good. Cool. Take it away super hi everyone hope you are all well really really delighted to be here um yeah really appreciate uh, the organizers reaching out inviting us here um my name is arman uh, and i'm also joined here by the um lovely 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 nina who i work with on iso um yeah we 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 had a nice discussion when when we were first approached about what we wanted to talk about in this in this space and uh, i guess we kind of came to the conclusion that having having been doing this for five years we'd kind of use it as a bit of a, a reflecting exercise on how the last five years have gone um talk about what we've done and perhaps try and i guess give an indication about why we do it as well um and, and and i'm really really keen to kind of actually whiz through the exercise the presentation rather as quickly as possible to get to the discussion because that's always my favorite part of of, of the session so um yeah um really really looking forward to kind of taking you through the journey um and, and getting through that conversation so uh, i think we can we can start with the next slide please so there's seven of us in in, in the group. Uh, as I said, my name is Arman, and there's Nina. There's also Faye, Ganesha, David, Michael, and Theo. And the important thing to I guess start off by saying is that none of us um, really studied architecture. None of us studied anything uh, around the built environment. Um, we were all connected to each other either as friends or friends of friends while studying in London and, and we were all doing quite different um, disciplines. So I was studying anthropology, Nina was doing design, um, some of us were doing photography, um, politics, um, film. Uh, but at the time, uh, really it was quite clear that we all had this interest in the city. We were all studying in the city, we were all engaged with the city. And because of where um, where London was going at the time and, and the changes we were seeing, um, we felt like uh, it was a it was a set of issues that we wanted to talk about and, and have a voice on. Um, and I, you know, the, without that interest, without that kind of uh, without that um, kind of understanding of the city, uh, it was hard for us to come together. Really, so I think that's the first kind of thing to say. Uh, next slide please and again it really really started off that it started as conversations that's a tower in elephant castle for those of you who don't know it's in south london and at the time half of us were studying at lcc london college of communication which is part of um, ual university arts and really we were studying there and, and, and visiting there and really seeing a massive massive change taking place uh, around us um, some of you might be feeling familiar with the haygate estate which was um, being demolished at the time and one of the um, really the most kind of traumatic episodes in, in, in recent um, uh, social history, public housing history within the UK. And it was that it was these experiences, these insights, which were really kind of sh uh, bringing us together. Um, and I guess as people who weren't built on environment practitioners, as people who weren't architects or weren't planners, we felt that there weren't really that many spaces for us to come and come together and, and, and talk about the issues that, that were important to us. And it was, it was with that in mind that, that the kind of magazine came together, um, starting from this position of, you know, we have something to say, we're citizens, we experience these things, but we didn't really feel like the, um, the, the typical spaces, whether it's the architectural publications or even to some extent the mainstream news, were really, really giving space for kind of non-specialists and, and, and non-built environment practitioners to, to come together and talk about these issues. Next slide, please. And, you know, we didn't really know what we were doing. Like none of us had ever published a, a magazine before. We really had no experience in this. And I think that's a, a kind of uh, an atmosphere which has continued over the last five years um and again it's, it, it links back to that kind of we didn't really have an educational background in, in the built environment but what what we realized is that as a group of six or seven it, it did kind of change a little bit in the early years we all had our own set of skills and, and experiences whether that was writing design publishing uh, curation, you know, some of us excelled in carpentry, set design, animation. We kind of realized that collectively we had a, um, a set of skills which we could kind of bring together and, and, and try and do something with them. And the magazine was really our, 
our kind of first um, attempt at bringing those skills together and, 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 and stamping something onto, onto London and onto the, the, the networks and communities that we we're a part of. And I think that's a really important thing to just keep in mind, you know, all the projects that have developed since the magazine, and we'll go into, we'll go into detail on those um, a bit later, you know, it was the first time we were doing that. We didn't know what we were doing. It was really a kind of DIY, just get up, try. You're going to probably fail, but you might also succeed. Just give it a go. And, and that's the kind of that's the kind of attitude which we, which we really try and promote and encourage and others as well. Um, and yeah, we work on a volunteering basis. So I think the first time we actually got paid was last year after four years. Uh, and that was just through kind of a project specific grant. So something that we've had to juggle um with full-time work with people leaving the country coming back to the country uh, and the kind of circumstances that, that life throws at you um and i'm going to pass it over to nina now to who will kind of give a bit more insight into the magazine thanks so if you go to the next slide um so i'm going to talk a bit about the magazine um next slide please so Basically, as Arne mentioned, um, initially the magazine really started from this whole belief that we had, which was that our environments and cities are defined by the inhabitants and the interactions that we have within these cities. But the problem that we saw was that the narrative, the, the people that were actually in control of the narratives were tended to be architects or professionals linked to the built environment industry. So what we wanted to do is basically shift the power dynamic and basically give the inhabitants a platform and a tool where they can be heard. And basically that's how ISOR started. I mean, it was sort of questions like who gets to define an ISOR and um, who is in charge of the narrative that really led us to create this platform and basically build a magazine. Um, at the moment, the magazine is produced in London, but we've grown to have a worldwide network of collaborators. I mean, this was through sort of chance or friends or open calls that we've gathered. And it's been really inspiring to see more and more people um, that we connect with around the world from Serbia to Seoul to Paris to Lincolnshire. We really, it's been really inspiring to see the different people and the different interests and different stories that come from all these different places. So yeah, I guess our goal was always to break stereotypes, encourage discussion, observe the life and the environment and really empower inhabitants to claim their narrative of the spaces that they inhabit. So the best way we thought well, how we could show you what our magazine is about is um, to show you a selection of our favorite spreads. So each of us picked a spread and I'll run you now through the selection. So next slide, please. So the first uh, slide is uh, Trash City. It basically talks about three personal narratives in three different cities. The cities are Belgrade, Cairo and Beirut. And Theo picked this one specifically because it's a great example of how a personal experience of either smelling trash, seeing trash or sort of being a protest related to trash can have like links to greater uh, context such as political corruption or inability to deal with trash. And also it was also a beautiful link of seeing like the three cities and how actually the, the issues we face are very similar on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so next one. Uh, so this one was picked by me. This is by Claire Köster. It's called Berlin Blups vor Vergnügen. It's in translation that is Berlin is bubbling with pleasure. So the story of this uh, is that Claire basically revisited an abandoned leisure center from her childhood. And she photographed it and collected a bunch of found images and objects. Um, and actually shortly after she visited this abandoned uh, center, it burned down. So essentially she also managed to preserve this little bit of history. Um, and I personally loved it because it was a great link between personal and communal history. And the whole process of working with Claire's stories and making it accessible to our readers was great because we really wanted to keep the authenticity of the language that she used. So we kept the German words, but then added translations that would sort of explain to our readers what is meant by these specific words. 
And in addition to this, um, all the images and objects that she picked up had a kind of historical value of that time. So for example, Jose Julien is like a, fa a famous schlager, which is sort of a, you it's still a, a kitschy sort of music genre from Germany and Austria. Or for example, that photo that you see sort of bottom left, um, there's basically a naked man on there and it's actually uh, related to the FKK, which is the free body movement that was very popular in Germany, which embraced nudity. And so I just love this kind of interaction of her personal need to go and visit her childhood um, sort of leisure center and then also contextualize it in the broader uh, history of that time. So next one. This is a uh, Zatari radio, uh, Zatari FM, Jordan's refugee radio station. And this is by Tom Critchley. It was picked by Gan. And this is a radio station that was set up in the Zatari refugee camp. Um, it's a great piece because it gives you insight into the context in which the radio is set up, but also how it functioned and how it was set up in this environment. Um, I think it, it's beautiful because it shows how also sound and music can be instigators of change or provide at least an ease or a distraction. And it's also an interesting way of looking how sort of places of unrest can also go beyond the essentials and how they can push the functionality and positivity further with little projects such as this. And this is a project that also we would all love to re revisit in a couple of years and see what kind of influence it's really had on the local community and people who have interacted with it. So next slide, please. Um, Armin, maybe I'll let you do this one uh, as you've picked uh, Nico's yeah, piece. Yeah, quickly talk about it. So this was, um, this was a, a Nico's piece, um, the title Fish, Chips and Piss what the, the sense in our cities can tell us. And I just found it really weird as an article and really strange as a concept. And, and, and it's the kind of um, content which I kind of, when I first started thinking about it, I saw it was exactly what I wanted to, to be promoting and celebrating. But actually, despite its, its weirdness and um, the kind of the vulgarity of, of the things it's talking about actually it was a really really poignant look at regeneration and gentrification because it was talking about how um uh, through these processes the actual scent and smell of a city changes and you know i think typically we, we associate um regeneration gentrification these processes with the the um the visual cues the visual signifiers um, and I thought just this article really honed in on another really, really important sensory aspect of our understanding of the city and of our experience with the city um, and, 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 and how that kind of um, can be thought about. So, um, yeah, an incredible article, one I would highly, highly recommend people read at some point. Back yeah. over to you. So we can go on to the next one then. Um, so this is a piece by George Selly. It's called Artifacts in Unexpected Places. Um, I mean, Michael picked this because it's honestly a really beautiful photo essay of a journey that George Selly took around Britain, exploring different historical moments in, in the sort of like the past 100,000 or even longer years. And so he revisited these spots that had a huge significance for Homo sapiens, but also like prehistoric um, settlers. And then it's kind of like a reflection, This his whole journey is a sort of a reflection between the connection of history and the, like our relationship between the sort of human, spatial and natural conditions and how that sort of manifests itself now. Um, so yeah, and the photographs are stunning. Um, so next slide. And so this is uh, Life in Calais. I know where I'm from, but I don't know where I'm going, but James and Kyrgyzou. Um, so Faye picked this because it's a really insightful uh, piece about the living conditions in Calais. Uh, Jameson went and uh, visited Calais a, a few years ago and spoke to a lot of people and stayed there for a while. So it gives you, quite a personal insight into the conditions, but also sort of the struggles that a lot of the people had and uh, this limbo state that they find themselves in. 
Um, and so he sort of reflects on this. And I think this was also around the time when Brexit was happening. So it was kind of like, it's it's an interview, but also a reflection of sort of what what is going to happen with these spaces and how 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 will we move forward? Um, so next slide, please. So this is the Voices of London's Latin Village by Emily Sarsom and Alex Karunas and Sarah England, and um, it basically talks about the people and the life behind Latin Village in London. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Latin Village is a market in London that is predominantly uh, occupied by the Latin community. Um, and it's been under threat for years and they've been in a battle to keep it and they're still struggling. And this story was just one of, I think, like our favorites to do because we managed to combine collaborators that we were really fond of together and sort of brought this story to life, but also Along with that, we actually established a close relationship with the market. And after multiple visits there, we sort of, our relationship also moved beyond the printed page. And since then we've also done uh, events and things like that with them. And so, yeah, it's kind of like, I think this, is, this piece is definitely one where we've also uh, started uh, moving away from just the printed word and also more into actually establishing stronger relationships with the spaces that we talk about where it's possible. So next slide. And yeah, so just a quick uh, word about our growth. Um, we, I mean, the way that we started out was really quite like sporadic and spontaneous and we just got something out. Uh, we only had 24 pages to start with and most of our uh, contributors were essentially like a local network of friends or people that you knew that were interested in similar topics. Um, but then as we like, as the years went by, we basically introduced an open call and through like a mix of word of mouth and the internet, we started to gain a much bigger network that by the end of it, um, in issue four, we, I think nearly tripled the contributors and the pages have also doubled. So we've kind of grown with like, uh, our network and sort of how things progress. Um, I think next slide, and I think this is where Armin will take over now. Thanks, Nina. As I think, I guess what the kind of last few slides have shown is that there's an incredible um, diversity to what we try and document and communicate. Um, so we really like our focus is all about understanding and, and, and documenting how individuals, communities, groups, societies relate to their built environment. And, you know, that obviously spans across across the world and different across different issues. And I think after, I guess, maybe issue two, um, so maybe like a year and a half into the magazine, we we started toying around with the idea of becoming more than just a magazine. I think that was kind of uh, somewhat rooted in limitations to the magazine as, as a medium. It takes a lot of time um, to produce, and that's kind of why I, I love it as well, but that can also be a hindrance. It's, it's quite expensive. Um, and it's, it's, it, I think the way that we were approaching the print magazine was that it was always a, a relatively niche product. You know, our, our like print run never exceeded a thousand. Um, and we very consciously at the beginning didn't want to have an online presence with, with, with the magazine. So it was always a print um, format, which, uh, you know, so it was therefore kind of finite. And I think after, after a while we realized like, look, we've got this thing, we've got these things to say, we've got this incredible network of collaborators. Um, let's try and kind of experiment with different uh, platforms and different and mediums. And how can we kind of deliver our vision through these different spaces? Uh, next slide, please. So, and talks were the first thing we, we um, I guess, like dived into. Um, and, and we organized uh, a series of talks that really focus in on, on, on issues and true to um, our principles and true to our vision, brought in a, a diverse set of individuals to come in, share the space, share the platform and, and, and discuss these details. So, you know, the platforms were always 
um, featuring people who can't be classified as built environment practitioners in the kind of traditional sense, but still through their work. And, and you could argue simply by being um, citizens within the this, this, this city um, had a really, really integral part to play in, in city making, in driving those issues and solving those issues. So, you know, we were inviting artists, we we're inviting activists, community organizers, all of these people who had something really, really important to say. So the first, you know, one, not the first one actually, yeah, uh, was the first one? Yeah, the first one was London in Limbo. And that was really exploring the idea of um, this, this notion of London being at a crossroads, um, having a crisis about the kind of city it wanted to be. Um, uh, again, we probably won't have time to, to go into detail whether it's still at that crossroads, but at the time we really felt it was in a, in a very particular moment and, and that conversation was dominated by housing. Um, so we we're talking about the history of, of public housing and, and new developments and, and all that kind of implies for, for the city. The second talk um, was called Culture Clash and, and we we're talking about culture-led regeneration and, and the prevalence of, of spectacle over substance in cultural policy uh, and how that was affecting communities and, and, and their ability to actually enjoy the cultural forms and, 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 and practices they wanted to. And the, those two talks were really important in, I guess, giving us the confidence to, to try something like Dilate, which was uh, a day-long program, um, really a kind of experiential um, uh, transformation of issue four. Um, so we kind of took the stories of issue four, the stories that we really liked and, and created a, a program uh, about it. And, you know, we explored Grenfell. Um, we invited uh, a filmmaker, filmmaker to come and um, show their film about Grenfell, which was amazing. And then, and then the rapper and activist Loki uh, came in and spoke after, which was, um, yeah, one of the most harrowing uh, sort of spaces I've been in, um, in my life, perhaps. I mean, really, really hard hitting truths. Um, and, and I think brought a lot of uh, a lot of people to a standstill. So that was, an, you know, a, a really powerful space to be in at the time. Uh, and then we had an exhibition of, of photos from issue four and then a panel discussion about uh, the role of uh, of collective network, self-organization, communities in, in, in kind of organizing and, and solving issues themselves. Uh, next slide, please. And again, for, apart from the talks and, and events, we've, we've um, I guess, tried to hand a podcast, which we haven't done in a few years, actually. It's something we, we, might, we might have to pick up soon. But um, initially start with podcasts, speaking to artists, uh, Root Blease Luxembourg, who some of you might know, did the front cover for the um, the streets original pirate material and also Block Party, um, and she, you know, amazing, amazing artist who spoke really beautifully about shooting the city, shooting the urban night. Um, Ian Sinclair, who I'm sure um, some of you will also know, uh, incredible uh, writer, you know, one of the grandfathers of psychogeography. Um, Saleti Cordua, who's um, a percussionist, a musician who's uh, released his debut album on Ninja Tune and has gone on to be a really, really important figure of, of um, the kind of UK jazz um, scene over the past few years. But his, his, his first album was this incredible meditation on space, city, people, entirely produced uh, amongst the community uh, within India. Uh, and, and he spoke really beautifully about the kind of relationship between music and, and the city. And then Nick Hartwright as well, who's a kind of social entrepreneur doing some really interesting work around uh, reactivating spaces around the city. And then workshops, again, a more recent thing. That that photo there is actually from Sheffield. We're invited by um, our, our good friends, uh, Resolve, who I know has, who have featured on this um, session before to take part in their residency at S1 Gallery. And that was a really, really nice um, kind of foray into public engagement workshops, uh, which, we've, which we've kind of continued since. Uh, next slide, please. And then there was Imprint, which um, for me, the most difficult thing we've done as I saw, but without a doubt, the most rewarding, without the, doubt, the most exciting, without doubt, the most interesting. And um, I think the one project that if I had to, which is really unfair, but if I had to kind of look back on the last five years, the one project that I'm the most proud of 
Um, so we're gonna we're gonna let the, the video play because um, they'll do better justice than I could ever do by talking about it, and then, we'll, and then I'll kind of give a little in uh, get an insight into what it was. Um, so hopefully the video works. And the purpose of it being that what we felt was a, a lack of space for people who are using print to talk about architecture, to talk about cities. And what brings them together is, I guess, a desire to talk about cities, a desire to talk about architecture, and using print and publishing to do so. Architectural design is something that's done through image most of the time. The whole production of knowledge is kind of directed through the eye. So I'm interested as to what happens when we pursue the world through our ears. I suppose we just see ourselves as sort of bringing out these voices to the surface. To us, we wanted something that could be printed if we thought it was more confidential. Like the act of tagging a name, marking a place, placing an X, subversive acts. When we start from here, then we go to Russia Square. What is more objective, a map, let's say, or a drawing of a place? How do you really get the truth of London? Oh, we definitely. So we've got a drill, we've got a jigsaw. Have this around one of these. That's what you print with. Thanks. I'm glad that worked. Um, yeah. So, imprint was really a celebration of of what we feel is a really important uh atmosphere and and community to to be celebrating at this moment in time and there's so many incredible practitioners and organizations who are now using print to talk about the city to talk about the built environment and these are people who aren't architects they aren't planners they aren't urban designers they're often community groups they're illustrators they're um, just students studying uh, this and that and you know we 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 felt part of that and we felt like it was um we were kind of being plugged into all these incredible people doing this amazing work and we really wanted to uh, to organize a space to to champion that and to 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 really give a kind of a sense of identity and and understanding to all these people so we organized the imprint um, we were really, really fortunate to get funding from Arts Council and AHMM to, to support us and, and we host that at the Building Centre. Uh, and it really was a three day uh, publishing fair, public program. Um, and as I said, something I'm, I'm, I'm really proud to have to have been a part of. Um, and, and we're really, really hoping that we can keep on doing them over the, over the coming uh, years. Um, yeah, Nina, I don't know if you wanted to say anything about it that I've perhaps missed. I think you covered that pretty well. I mean, I think also what was really nice about it was uh, we basically just brought in everyone we admire into a space and more um, because we we also always do an open call. So we actually got introduced to many new people. And I think for us, that's always the beauty of all these events that we do is that we constantly keep meeting people that do such inspiring and like important work. And um yeah, it's it's just always nice. And the workshops were also uh, fun to do um, during this, um, the fair, which were also all related to kind of how you see and experience the built environment. So yeah, it was a fun, fun time. I think on the subject of open calls, I think it's, it's still with you to talk about the big open call. The next oh, one. yes, yes. Next, next slide, one. please. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the premiere of our open call. Exclusive. Um, Exclusive. Yeah, no one has heard about many this. years, but we are back <laughs> slowly. Um, we have nothing online about it, but we know the theme, <laughs> and it will soon be posted online on all these different channels but you get to see it exclusively now. The theme is uh, Law Spaces, and uh, we will basically launch it soon with more information. But if you are interested, and if you think that the work you are doing or thinking about is similar to what we've just shown, um, just send us an email and we'll keep you in the loop and uh, give you a bit more information about it. Um, but yeah. 
Wait, Nina, Nina, I feel like I feel like you need to uh, give some justice to the amount of thought that you, Michael, and Theo have put into this. Because just to put into context, we stopped like the last the last issue we did was uh, 2018, um, so it's a while ago now. We consciously decided to not do another issue because we wanted to do dilate and we wanted to do imprint and we don't do ISO full time. We have other stuff going on, so you know there's only so much we can do. Um, and, and we decided to kind of put a pause on, on the print. Um, and it was really only the beginning of, of um, lockdown. So coming up to a year ago now that we decided to pick it up. But we really wanted to do something different and, and not just kind of do what we had been doing with the past four issues and try something new. So um, Nina, explain more about your process and like what you did and, and, and how you kind of approach how we're kind of approaching it for, for the next issue. Yeah. I mean, to be honest, everything in ISO starts with chaos. <laughs> and then it slowly makes sense after like multiple conversations and like someone always being the devil's advocate and then we somehow distill it into something that makes sense um so basically we we basically have decided to completely redesign the issue for several reasons uh one of them being that the format was rather unpractical and we wanted to have more space for our contributors and the second was also that we wanted to, we felt like the way that we've been doing our magazine so far, it was kind of like we, we rarely commissioned pieces and we rarely had like a guiding vision behind each issue. It was kind of like we gathered into interesting stories together, curated them together, but it was never like, um, yeah, there was never like a clear vision behind each issue. And this is kind of like what we wanted to introduce. Um, we were also introduced to transition design, which if you don't know, I highly recommend that you Google it. It is very important to our process now. Um, and basically it was just the importance of having visions and using that in like your, your goal to change things. So after many discussions, we basically decided to come to the theme of lost spaces and the way that we will be exploring it is basically through identity systems and dreams because this is kind of how we categorized experiences and it was also important for us that we basically one of our biggest fears is that we don't become academic this is like i think all of us in our team this is like one of our number one fears so we were like the way that we also see these categories is that we allow space for things that are um not academic not necessarily like a journalist approach to space but it can also be like an artist's approach a poem um you know just speculation about the future and things like that so basically that's why we decided to come up with these three different systems and the idea is actually that um well i will say this it might change but maybe not um, the idea is basically to think of this issue as a uh, triplet. The fourth one is still in debate, but the idea is that they all complement each other. So this one will be lost spaces, the next one will be building spaces, and the final one will be sustaining spaces. So we hope that these three issues will sort of complement each other and provide insight into really understanding the world that we live in, what we can do about it, and what we can actually really bring about um in terms of like change and how can we really reclaim uh, our spaces and our narrative and what are some great examples of people that have already been doing that and how can we share these experiences on an international level and maybe pick apart the bits that are appropriate for our personal community that is the dream but we'll see how it goes um and yeah wait. i can't wait no i'm really excited <laughs> for it I think that's it. I think that's oh, yeah. that on the final slide, you can see our email if you want to email us. <laughs> <laughs> Ta -da. Ta -da. Ta -da. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having us. No, thank you very much for coming. That was so interesting. It's so sort of, I think architecture's got a real problem with sort of architects and that's like the bubble that we're in. So it's so nice to hear about um, different avenues um, down there. So yeah, as you say, um, if we could get some question and answer going, that would be lovely. Um, so if you've got a question, if you want to either pipe up or um, type it in the chat box and um, I'll read it out. But I just wanted to start um, 
and ask you about the um, stuff you're doing over lockdown, like the quarantine um, spaces series um, and just sort of how that came about. And um, yeah, just interested to know more about that. Nia, yeah, that's yours. Yeah, so um, I think, I don't know, I, I think at the start of quarantine, it was kind of like this, the moment felt very monumental um and i think it was kind of just this idea that we felt like we needed to document this time in one way or another and so that's basically how the quarantine space idea came about um because we were just hoping that like a lot of people just share their like how they're viewing the world and what they're experiencing and that we can have this as a sort of mini archive of this the beginning of big change um and that's that's kind of it's now been put on pause because we didn't realize what how much work <laughs> goes into um <laughs> running a space like that um so we managed to do it for the first few months of the lockdown and then yeah unfortunately life got in the way so we've had to put it on pause I guess also a lot of us didn't realize that the lockdown would really be as long as it is now. Um, but I think even what we gathered in those first few months was really just, it was really inspiring to be honest. And, you know, everyone was having a tough time, but it was, I think what I really loved about it is people really were happy to like share their thoughts and they were all really happy to also get published, even though like, we're not necessarily like a big publishing company or anything like that, but it was kind of also, I guess, this need that for connections that people had at the beginning of the lockdown. And I sort of loved this new sort of virtual space and the connections that we had also through there. And it was also just beautiful seeing what people were up to, the thoughts and like getting also things from places like outside of like, where we usually expect it from so usually it's like the uk we get a lot of things but we got things from many other parts of the world that was quite it was yeah it was great it was a nice little project yeah yeah i thought it was really good very lots of intimate details and sort of like everyday bits like felt really special so i really enjoyed it yeah it was nice and um, does anyone else have any questions anyone want to do you, do you mind if we stop stop presenting? No, I was going to say you want me to. I was trying to leave your email address on, but I'll stop presenting. Okay, That's good. Cool. That's cool. Okay. I think there's some questions in the chat. Like, oh, it's there. Oh yeah, lovely. Yeah, me and John go. <laughs> hey. So I think there might be a question in here somewhere, but I was just super keen for you to get come on board and get involved with Sheffield, partly because here we have such a focus on. Um, collaboration on like the social ethos and um, I think what stems through quite a lot of our own research is basically gathering stories and how can we represent narrative through buildings so I think quite a lot of the work that probably people do it wouldn't take that much effort to kind of formulate it into like quite a nice story or like something to be able to publish so I do encourage everyone here that there are so many narratives so many experiences weird and wonderful that you've probably already explored for your um, for your project, which might even be like the smallest thing, just to work out one building, but a small bit of elaboration might make um, make other people understand what your thought process was. And again, by doing that, we might be able to break down the barriers between how architects communicate their ideas and the people receiving it. So I think just looking at through the way that you do manage to gather so much like collective opinion from all these different um backgrounds etc i think that's so nice and i think um if anything it re re-emphasizes re the point for us as architects in the way that we design we should be collaborative we should be talking to our users we should be talking to people who aren't necessarily from a practicing background to be able to gather opinion and thought into the work that we do so thank you so much for like just actually sort of re-emphasizing that point which again especially when we're in lockdown and in our own little bubble that's probably quite easy to forget that um an assortment of people will come across our structures even if they're not using it they might be living five doors down the road they might be across the city but they will have an impact on what we're doing on the way that they view the built environment mm -hmm. so um with that little uh, monologue <laughs> done sorry really interesting. Um, that's really yeah i mean I'd, I'd yeah i completely hear you and i completely agree with all of that um and i think there's a really it's there's a really important role for 
storytelling in all that we do like whether it, whether you're an architect or a politician or um any any practitioner who's kind of has a, a relationship with people and communities and 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 there's a kind of there's a there's a human element to their work i think that the role of storytelling is is incredibly important and again i, I would argue that it's it's a skill that's being lost I don't think it's a skill that we have really um, kind of given to us or, or, or developed in us as we as we grow older. And I think that's got, you know, I think I'm gonna have to organize another talk for me to come and like just give talk chat my uh, chat my shop about that specific element. But like, I just think there's a real dearth of, of storytelling in our society. And the more you, we can be storytellers, the more we can bring people. Um, the more we can transform and the more we can kind of bring people along with us for the adventure and i think with architecture which is such a fundamental um tool for change such a fundamental tool for um kind of navigating the world and building the world storytelling is is integral to that you know really really have to become better storytellers and i think, I think it's also it's like about listening honestly because a lot of people like just don't listen to the people that they should be listening to. Mm -hmm. And also like, uh, I guess an element of empathy and putting yourselves into like other shoes, but maybe not even human ones. It's also, I mean, this is wild, but like imagining how your building is in relation to a tree or an ant or a butterfly or something that is also beyond just humans. Mm -hmm. Because I think that element is also often forgotten when people consider making cities and spaces and things like that. Um, but nature always fights back, funnily enough. <laughs> <laughs> I think what you uh, have just brought up um, really touches upon um, a lunchtime talk we had earlier this week, was it on Monday? Um, where we had um, a couple of the eye line drawing um, winners come in, so Desi and Aaron Joy, and they basically partly why their drawings were so delightful is about the narrative that they were using and the way that they picked up this drawing technique to really display what the story is and then the architecture kind of follows through from that mm -hmm. so again I think it's just like you say the narrative and who you're speaking to and who's it about um should be like one of the first things that we think about when we get to design but also carry all the way through so um yeah um yeah, for real. Agreed. Well, no, no more cat drawings on billboards. <laughs> <laughs> and I re and I vividly remember the um, piss fish and I can't remember what piss, chips and uh, fish no, fish chips and piss. Yeah, I would strongly recommend people to read that as well because um, yeah, it's that kind of like um, secondary sensory thing that you do get when you're walking through um, and those changes like you know when there's a baker around because of the smell right. so if you remember that moment and start feeding into that kind of sensory experience when you walk through different places um, yeah that's that, awesome. that, so the, the one thing I didn't mention was that was the first article that I read which opened me up to the fact that like you know when you walk past Starbucks or Costa or Subway and like the smell just comes out that was that article put me onto the fact that that's all fake and artificial and it's actually manufactured which I think became kind of common knowledge after um but I had no idea at the time so but there's also that McDonald's smell that's horrible <laughs> it's also like, in every city you can smell McDonald's because there's this kind of like weird smell that it emits they didn't quite do it right <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm going to hop in with a question and it follows on from the, like the storytelling and stuff um, because because of COVID we've obviously had all these new spaces to um, to storytell and, and like now we've got this whole space where anyone could be everywhere um, talking together um, it's not necessarily a bad thing, but how do you see um, your guys like documenting of the built environment changing once we start to get unlocked? Like, are there things that you'll keep, things that you've learned, things that you'll leave behind? I think this is why we chose law spaces as our theme. <laughs> um, I mean, personally, I, I definitely can speak for the whole team. I think the way that I see it is, I think we're at a really it's an interesting time because I do think there's like we're in the midst of a huge transition and change whether we like it or not 
Um, but I mean, I think for us, also, like picking law spaces was also really important because it's important to acknowledge, like, why are we losing certain spaces? What are the spaces that we've we are keeping? What are spaces that we've lost that maybe it's like it's better that they're lost? And sort of understanding how to sort of live with all these losses. Like some are more dramatic than others, but I, I think there's also like maybe it's also time to just kind of like reflect a bit on what is happening around us and why is the built environment the way it is and what functions, what doesn't, like do we all really need to be in offices? Mm -hmm. Maybe not. Um, and rather than just thinking, okay, what's the next step? Maybe it's like better to just like reflect back and think about sort of like take it a bit slower. That will be the dream for the built environment, but I'm not sure if that is the reality. <laughs> yeah, agreed. No, I agree with that, Nina, 100%. I think, um, yeah, I, it's definitely been, uh, I, think, I think just the past year kind of, obviously having the time to um, just take a step back in some respects and just think much more broadly about what's going on um, has, been a really transformative experience for myself but also I think an experience that that Nina went through and 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 kind of shared back with the group and therefore kind of all gone through as I saw um I mean look, who knows who knows what the next few years is going to bring like it's mm -hmm. a fool if I even begin to try and guess um who knows I do I do really think though that um yeah, the possibilities are um, open in a way which they haven't been in our in our generation. I really do believe that. I think we're we're at a time where we are able to to start thinking um, not only positively but um, collectively, collaboratively, and I think in ways that um, the, the kind of opportunity for it hasn't 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 quite come in in in, in such a way. Um, and I think the role that you know, like people who are spatial practitioners, whether you're an architect, urban designer, a planner, um, or just someone who like knows what's going on in terms of the built environment and the architecture, I think like I, I really, really, really think that it's they're one of the groups of people who are like at the forefront of, of kind of articulating what that future can be and then, and then driving that change. Um, and it's a really, really very diverse space you know i think mm. it's, it's 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 a space where anyone can kind of chime in and uh, I think it's actually designing buildings or, or publishing or programming or um engaging communities you know it's it's super super varied we need we need everyone you know yeah yeah i mean you're you're in charge of like our apartments so <laughs> if you make beautiful apartments people will be happier because i think also like to be fair in lockdown i think most people must have realized how unpractical or the lack of sunlight there is yeah. in certain spaces and i think this is also something that for example is like I'm not entirely I'm I'm not entirely sure what causes it by certain buildings but sometimes it's also just this carelessness of considering humans as just like this dot that occupies the building rather than inhabitants and that requires certain things from their space um so I'm also sure that like you know from people just being inside a lot I feel like there will be this newfound sort of way of also con thinking about our like the spaces that we inhabit on a regular basis and I'm sure many people have, you know, reshuffled, redecorated, rejugged their life to adjust to this new way. So, yeah. Yeah, that was a nice answer from you both. Really nice. I have another question, but I don't know if other people have another question. I just wanted to say someone in the chat said that there, where can we find the article? So our issue three is sold out. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's about to tie for the chat. Yeah. So we can send it to, we can send, no, I just wanted to say we can send it to one of you as a PDF and you can share it along to, uh, I don't know if you can see the participants or not. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely we can do that. Um, my next question was gonna be uh, a slightly more like personal thing. Um, because obviously we've all, we're sort of juggling uni and being stuck at home. Um, 
And I was just wondering, like you guys as creatives, what your outlets have been over lockdown that were, wasn't your just like job? Because obviously I saw is that sort of thing. Um, but what, what other things have you guys been like getting stuck into? Yeah, you go, you go first. <laughs> uh i mean quarantine space was i think a, a big outlet i think that was probably took up a lot more time than expected i think other than that to be honest i've been escaping to the nature any chance that i get and i've just been cycling to these fields that are relatively close to my house and just escaping humans <laughs> that is what i've been doing um i found a new newfound appreciation for nature like the further away from the city the happier I am, basically. <laughs> yeah, definitely nature nature's been massive for me actually as well. Um yeah, definitely trying to be amongst it as more than, than before lockdown. I think I've kind of responded to it in different ways in different times. Um it's been it's obviously coming up to a year now and that's an incredible long uh, you know it's an incredible long amount of time and although it's gone quickly it's um it's 12 months and I think yeah if i kind of if i look back on the last 12 months i've kind of reacted at different to different things in different ways and and at sometimes indulged in the sadness and in times like being optimistic at times resorted to kind of cooking and, and art and music but equally um made sure i'm i'm there supporting my family my friends so it's been really really varied but i think the the constant has just been um i guess kind of appreciating and being grateful for the good things um which again i can only speak for myself here but they have they, they've been they've been there throughout the last 12 months despite despite the difficulties my health is fine the health of my family is fine my job's been fine so you know counting counting my blessings to that end and that's really been the, the important thing to keep me through yeah nice and as well um nina because it's kind of the same thing talking about architects and how you kind of design hu with humans in a, a, a secondary when we're talking about nature and stuff and mm. everyone gets locked inside and then we realize that we want somewhere to go and escape to and we need somewhere to go some kind of natural environment a green space and not everyone has that like at their fingertips and it's just it, i think that for me that's been a really interesting time of reflection over the past sort of year I mean, so many cities are so badly made in that aspect. Even, like, even in Vienna, I'm, to be fair, where I live in Vienna is, like, nobody wants to live here. It's very, it's not very popular amongst the, the youth. Um, mm. But because I moved back in with my parents and then COVID happened, I just sort of stayed around. And so I've only started appreciating mm. it now. I hated it as a teenager because I was always like, I want to be in the city where all the things are happening, where life is. And now I'm like, oh, I'm so glad I'm in the middle of nowhere. The fields are relatively close. And like, I've got nature because there's not a lot of parks basically in Vienna. And like, there's just not that much nature. If you're like living in the city, there's only like a few spots. And when the lockdown happened, those spots were rammed full like yeah. and kind of it kind of defeats the whole point of having an, an escape to nature mm -hmm. so i mean i would hope that from this maybe more parks and things get introduced i don't know where there's not really a space but um i don't know even just having trees on the street this is something i've recently noticed and it frustrates me so much that every single tree has been ripped out because of cement and sometimes I'm walking through the city and I'm like I feel like I'm suffocating because of all the cement around me that I'm like where is a tiny bit of grass or just like yeah. no mud or like Austrians for example you can never walk in the wild there's a path everywhere you go on a mountain there's a path you go in the fields there's a path you always got to stay on the path. And I'm like, oh my God, where's the wilderness? Um, Such a metaphor for life. <laughs> it really is. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know, maybe it's like, it's like less design, more wilderness. That is what I would hope would come out of this, but I don't really know what will, what will happen, to be honest. Yeah. Just things that I wasn't really, I didn't even think about before because you're, you're just, you had like a different life, I guess. You just didn't notice these things yeah yeah, yeah. and maybe didn't dream as much either <laughs> yeah 100 <laughs> yeah, percent 
Yeah, it's so interesting to like, having the time to like thoughtfully walk. Like I feel like the way that I walk now has massively changed from before. Like being able to walk around, and actually think about things rather than like walking to somewhere. Now I've had quite a similar experience at where I live. Like where my parents live is literally in the middle of nowhere, and I've always hated it. Whereas now it's actually been quite nice, so I can relate to that one. Um, I just had a quick question and then Mimi, you can go for it. Um, I was just sort of the idea of being, um, you were saying like you didn't really know what you were doing when you started and like the idea of like being a novice and just sort of going for it and then sort of learning as you go. I think that's a really interesting thing and I just wondered if you had any general um, sort of tips or advice for sort of starting up your own thing like off your own back without much um, existing experience. Mm, that's quite a broad good. question but if you just... it's a great question it's a great question um you know any any immediate thoughts just do it unless you think about it the 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 higher chances you have of success i mean the the oh, i i think we're just so we were we're still so chaotic and you know i don't know there's like there's all these professional ways how you can do things and then you can do the whole market research and then by the end of market research you're so like depressed that there's all these other things that you never end up doing your project but mm -hmm. i think if you really believe in something and you really have to love it to be honest like yeah. i think if you're going to do something love it because you're not going to get money for a very long time and when the times get tough and you have to juggle work and everything at least do something that you love. And this is what we really try to maintain in ISOR is that like, we don't do projects that none of us want to do. And we really do things that we really believe in and that we love because those that's the only reason why we'd want to do it. Um, and yeah, that's the best tip. Collaborate, like, collaborate, collaborate, collaborate. I was thinking about this, yeah. the it's just like, it's such an obvious thing to say, but you know, there's no chance in hell that anything that we have done as I saw, whether it's like something on the scale of imprint or whether it's just like a blog post or a post on Instagram, like it just wouldn't have been possible by one person. Like it had to be done collectively. I am the last person you want to come to, to like go up a ladder to like hang something. I'm the last person you want to come to when I to like design something on, on, on Illustrator so that there's but i knew that nina is going to be amazing at that i knew that michael and gan and theo and david they're all going to be incredible at doing that and so it's but you like just pooling all those resources together and all their skills together and, and just getting on with it um yeah it's really 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 key just to look around you and, and understand what you've got around you and then just try and kind of collectivize that and, and bring that together and, and 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 strive for something together and also it's fine to fail like it's fine to not know what you're doing it's fine to be shit at it so excuse my french like it's fine it's not um yeah one shouldn't strive for perfection one shouldn't strive for purity um they can be kind of the enemies of, of progress i think in, in many instances so just just get up and do it don't be shy just um yeah just feel like just 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 feel like you're kind of making progress every now and again i think that's the most important thing really also, don't be afraid to get in touch with the people that you love you, the work of because yes, yeah. you'd be surprised how happy people are to like collaborate and talk and I don't know. I think that's also something that like I remember when I was in university, it used to scare me, but actually like usually it's just people behind it and the best point is when you meet someone who's doing something amazing and they're not an asshole which is like <laughs> not always the case. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes you meet your heroes and you're like, oh, oh, disappointment. <laughs> when you meet someone who's super nice and they're doing amazing work, you're like, oh. <laughs> yeah, that have, was a lovely answer. We, just, just quickly, I think the other thing just quickly say, I think like the, from, my, from my travels and just being like connected with other people around the world, they all are amazed at how collaborative the UK is inherently something that it's we, that we don't appreciate because we're obviously in it but so many people are just amazed at how collaborative london is how collaborative sheffield is manchester is leeds is all these places not only like in them but also with each other um so many people that have moved to the uk 
from other places um feeling like they can't reach out to people they can't work with people they can't do all these things and then been amazed at how open everyone is to it so i think that kind of atmosphere is really important for us to kind of not only capitalize on it but perpetuate it and and, and allow it to grow um because it's you know we're we're here now it's our responsibility to kind of keep that keep that moving in that respect yeah that's definitely something we should use for our advantage that was a lovely answer very inspiring stuff um mimi have you got a question um kind of a question kind of a i think i said hi to barney at the beginning um i don't know if barney's still there but i think he wrote he's a contributor for um quarantine space and i was wondering seeing that you are here i didn't know if you wanted to speak up and sort of say Sorry, what was the question again? My, um, I'm cooking the mute stretch fan is in. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just wondering um, what was your story behind getting involved with Eyesore and um, have you... Uh, I'm, it's kind of nepotism in a way. Nina's a really good friend of mine. We went to uni together and she suggested that I get, <laughs> that I get involved. Um, but it, uh, yeah, I kind of know a few of the people behind it. but. Um, it's I don't not nepotism. She suggested it, and I uh, I submitted something um, for it, and it was like independently reviewed. Um, yeah. Um, what could you tell us a little bit about what your article was on? Just to give everyone an idea of another range of yeah, of course. Um, so I'm not really connected to uh, architecture at all. I'm a chef, and I studied graphic design, so I kind of work in the confluence of the two um, and my article was about uh, I did a couple of articles for them one of them was about um, during lockdown I found a seam of natural clay near where my parents live in Bath and I was um, using the clay to create ceramic pots which I would then wood fire and then I would um, I was doing a lot of baking as well so then I would bake the, the bread inside the pot trying to like emulate the cooking techniques of um, prehistoric bakers. And I was, uh, the article was about my um, process of knowing how to cook, knowing how to like knead dough and all of these like muscle interactions that I have, um, which I don't even think about and how one can uh, use the skills that they already have and transfer them, translate them into another practice so I, I'd never really done ceramics before but it was a very similar process um, in terms of working with the clay shaping it and then cooking it and then all of the stages and it was, it was uh, kind of trying to inspire people maybe to try something new which they might not think that they had the power or the will to do but they might actually be quite good at it with all their free time. I love that replication or that similarity between knowing a, knowing a skill and then being able to pass over the similarities and finding out the different mm. nuances. And I think, again, that's something that as we design, we might have designed a library before, but then designing a different one, it has got all of these different complications to it. Yeah. Readdress yeah, it, yeah, exactly. You know, into a new setting. I mean, I think my um, a large part of my interest in food is design which is like I've never really met a chef who's done design work previously, but it feeds into a lot of what I do in terms of um, in design, you think about the end product, whereas food is kind of like the process that leads towards it. So it's interesting to like meet the two in the middle. Uh, um, I'm sitting here thinking I was wishing I was around your dinner table tonight. <laughs> yeah. What is for dinner? Barney is a great uh, uh, I just, it's kind of just like a little bit of a mixed match of everything. Modest. I feel like that's code for really complicated. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you won't know it. You won't know it. <laughs> you know <understand. laughs> no, that's. I, I'd like to um, read your piece as well. It sounds very nice. Really nice. This is all mm, yeah. in space that you can actually access online. Nice. Article. It was very popular also. Was yeah the guilt free article as well. I mean that that was really. Oh cool. uh, yeah, I forgot I about that one. Read that. I read that and I think that's kind of what I was talking about before, as like indulging my sadness, like kind of like thinking about the fact that 
I can kind of indulge myself in, in things that perhaps I shouldn't. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I completely forgot about that. I might reread it, you know? Yeah, I'll, I'll put it. In. <laughs> you already put it in the chat, Mimi. Wicked, wicked. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I don't know. Do we have any other contributors here? <laughs> I'm sorry, I've sort of pinpointed you down, Barney. But... No, you're fine. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. I can't. I don't recognise any other names on the. No, but Gan is here, who's part of our team. Is Gan here still? So. Uh, Gan, reveal yourself. Hey. <laughs> if you can see me, hello, Hi. hello, hello. It's been lovely to hear your words on uh, everything. Yeah, it's been actually quite nice just sitting back and listening for once. Thanks for joining. <laughs> any time any time yeah barney's piece was really really nice um there's quite a few actual really nice pieces in the quarantine space um honestly kudos to nina for coming up with that and it was interesting to see how it just grew and grew and grew um you know to to maybe nina's detriment in regards to time but um yeah no ultimately i think it was yeah a really really good idea i mean i don't really have much to say i didn't contribute to it so <laughs> um yeah, I don't know yeah else much, the variety was amazing I, I yeah like from recipes to videos to sound to mixes to photographs to articles it was really yeah incredible you have to get a backup maybe if the lockdown continues no Hopefully not. <laughs> <laughs> well, also, the thing is, is the summer came around as quarantine space was really like going. Well, that's when we were also then everyone was set free, but it was just you don't want to be sitting in front of a computer more than you need to. To be honest, mm -hmm. that was that that is ultimately what led to the end of quarantine space. But it was also people don't. I think a lot of people just don't realize how much work goes into something that seems very simple um online or offline um because even like doing a magazine is like i think for most people they, they think oh yeah that's going to be such a fun little project that you do but it's actually like all of those things are a lot of work and you really start to appreciate like more and more when you see like other people who are doing like a similar thing to you and they've done it also really well or like better or like all these different things because also in the back of your head head all you can think about is like wow that was a lot of work like mm -hmm. and i think that's also i think when you're making things you always appreciate like other people's work and craft more because you realize the process and the hard work that goes into it and that really nothing is as simple as it seems although i think we often think it's simple and then even like myself included, and then two months in, we're like, no, a poor vision. Yeah, does anyone else have any, any more questions? Any last comments? If not, I think um, we might start to wrap up. That was such a lovely talk, really inspiring, especially at the point where I thought of mid project. Yeah, round of applause. <laughs> um, yeah, lovely stuff. Um, and yeah, if anyone um, wants that email address again, I'm sure if you email Suas, um, we can sort you out. Um, but yeah, just thank you very much for sacrificing your Thursday evening for us. Um, lovely to talk to you both. And thank you for yeah. having me. Yeah, Thanks, far, far from a sacrifice. Thank you so much. Yeah, really, thanks. Really, nice. really lovely. And yeah, we'll send you we'll send you the PDF of um issue three and yeah, share. We can we can even share the slides maybe so you have all that information in detail. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much from us. Hopefully, hopefully hear from you guys soon and look forward yeah, to keep in touch. new ways of 100 percent collaborating. Wicked. Definitely. Yeah. Nice to meet you guys. See you later. Yeah, thank you. Bye, bye. Bye, bye. Bye, Bonnie, Nina, Dan. Yeah.